three. Swedish programmer Ola Bini joins us for an interview after 70 days behind bars. President Nicolas Maduro and the head of the army lead an act marking the Battle of Carabobo Day. And in Haiti, anti-corruption protests held in several cities continue as citizens demand the resignation of President Jovenel Moise. Hello and welcome to Telesur. I'm Doris Polo in Quito and this is From the South. Bars for Swedish programmer and data privacy activist Ola Bini, who was released from an Ecuadorian prison on Thursday. As we've reported, Bini, who is a friend to WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, was accused of plotting to hack computer systems in an attempt to destabilize Ecuador's government. With no proof, he has yet to be charged, but since accepting a writ of habeas corpus filed by his defense attorneys, the court approved his release, but with certain conditions. We are joined by Ola Bini, who will provide us with an update since his release. Hello, Ola, and thank you for joining us. Hello, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm glad to be able to be here in person. So, um, how does it feel to be home with your family since, you know, being in behind bars for 70 days without actually officially being charged? It, it feels very, very good to be out. Uh, I'm sadly not able to be home with my family because they are back in Sweden, but I'm out and I'm with my friends and family, uh, sorry, with my friends who are taking good care of me. So it feels, <laughs> it feels surprising. Uh, I didn't expect it, but I'm very happy as well. So after your release on Thursday, you said that you are not at all free. Tell us how the authorities continue to infringe on your freedom. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I was released from the prison because the court showed that the habeas corpus was correct, that my rights had been violated from the beginning of this process, that my detention was illegal. But the investigation that started with this illegal detention is still going on. All my devices are still being uh, investigated. I still don't have access to my apartment for no legal reason whatsoever. And so this whole process is still going on. And although I'm currently outside of prison, now we have to actually continue to prove my innocence, even though a court has said that this whole process started completely illegally. So, can you tell me about the treatment you received behind bars and the conditions of the prison? Absolutely. So, when I first came to, to um, CDP El Inca, uh, there were 95 people in my cell block. Uh, I was in a cell block called El Placer. And, uh, the, the prisoners there had 17 cells for 95 people. Uh, it was a significant overcrowding, and as far as I know, uh, the maximum in Elinka has been about 2,400 people, uh, prisoners, while I was there, uh, in a building or in a set of buildings in a prison that is meant for maximum 1,000 people. So this overcrowding that I faced was exactly the same through the rest of the prison. I slept on the floor for the first uh, for the first month uh, because we were eight people sleeping in my cell uh, sometimes nine people uh, there was only one bed and there was one mattress the mattress was on the floor and and there was some cardboard on the bed so that people could have access to a little bit of the mattress basically five or six people had their head and their upper body on the mattress and lay next to each other uh, we didn't have light in our cells uh, there was only light in the corridor outside we have no access to clean water so our friends and family from the outside had to buy water for us to be able to not be dehydrated uh, people were sick a lot about half the people in the cell block were sick at any given time I think I felt sick probably four or five times during these 70 days uh, Part of the reason was because we were so crowded, but of course we also had uh, no access to sanitation because we only had dirty water and that water was only available part-time during the day. So in fact, one of the main activities in the cell block every day, some people stood and we filled up the, the empty, the empty uh, water bottles that we got from the outside. After people finished drinking the drinking water, we saved the water bottles and we saved up all the water so that when the water disappeared, uh, which it happened sometimes after two hours, sometimes
sometimes after four hours, so we would have water in the bottles instead. We had no warm water. Uh, we had, uh, for 95 people, we had four toilets where one toilet didn't work at all, uh, two toilets didn't have any, uh, any doors, and every time you flushed, the water disappeared from the rest of the cell block. Uh, I think those, oh yeah, we, we got to go outside. We see the sunlight uh, maximum five hours per week. Uh, my eyes were probably damaged, uh, I don't know if permanently, but they've been damaged enough that I have real trouble with my eyes all, since coming out because of consistently being in shadow and darkness and only seeing the sunlight for a few hours every week. Uh, we could only receive two visitors for three hours every week, so the isolation was very, very strong. There was a lot of violence outside, although in my cell block, my, my, in, my fellow inmates were actually taking very good care of me and uh, they were very good to me and they helped protect me against uh, some of the violence and, and the problems from the rest of the prison. So you mentioned being sick uh, at least four times. Yes. Were you able to receive access to any medical care at all? They have a medical center, it's, it's fairly overworked and, and in general they only prescribe paracetamol for people that don't have serious conditions and, and getting access to the medical center takes a long time and is hard work and you have to sit in the waiting room for four or five hours before you get any help. And were you ever interrogated or questioned while you were in prison? No, not a single time, not a single question. Uh, let me take that back. I was asked one question which is to provide the passwords for my devices. That was the only question that the, that the uh, prosecution ever asked me. Okay, um, so your attorneys argued that there was a lack of due process, violation of legal security, lack of motivation and disrespect for the presumption of innocence. So as the investigation against you continues, do you intend to take legal action against the state? Uh, so I first want to uh, say that it's not just my attorneys that claim these things. Now the habeas corpus actually shows that a tribunal of judges has also confirmed that all the things that you mentioned are true, that there was a lack of due process, that there was a lack of, uh, a lack of rights uh, in my detention that I wasn't given my uh, proper, uh, proper rights, I wasn't given access to a translator, I wasn't given access to my lawyers, I was held in an illegal uh, area for detention, uh, I was held for significantly longer than the law provides and so on and so on. In terms of legal action, uh, right now we are focused on continuing to proving my innocence, we're continuing to work on making sure that this investigation gets shut down because it started legally and it is illegally and it hasn't found any proof of wrongdoing from my side. So our current legal focus is to make sure that this investigation stops as quickly as possible. Once that's over, my legal team will discuss whether taking legal action uh, is a good option or not. So it's no secret that you are friends with WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange, whom you visited several times while he was at the Ecuadorian embassy in England. That affiliation is one of the reasons why your team believes you are being targeted. But are there any other reasons that you feel you are the subject of an investigation by the government? I don't know. Uh, at the end of the day, I, I have no idea. I'm a friend of Julian Assange, this is completely true. Uh, and maybe that's something that is a reason for them to go after me. I don't know what other reason there could be. So Ecuador's prosecution has said that you possess computers and zip drivers as a justification for why they have accused you of attempting to attack their systems. Yet these are things that software developers possess. So what do you feel is the reason uh, the US and Ecuadorian government finds your work so intriguing? <laughs> I don't know. I, I think, I mean, I work on protecting privacy, I work on protecting security, and, and sometimes, uh, sometimes people find this threatening, but honestly, I have no idea, and they've never told me why they did this. Um, and as an activist, um, you've spoken out about uh, protecting privacy and data privacy, and mm -hmm. I mean, tell, tell us more about that. Absolutely. For me, Privacy is one of the most important human rights out there and the reason for this is because privacy to me is fundamental to democracy. If you don't have the right to privacy, you don't really have a real democracy and, and in my opinion protecting that right to privacy is important. We're seeing encroachment into privacy from all directions, from private enterprises, from government all around the world and I think that this needs to be, uh, we need to put this in check. 
And at the same time, security is also part of this. The internet is a very insecure place where, where ransomware and random attacks happen all the time. Regular people all around the world need to be protected against these threats. And, and there are very few people working on this. So for me, working on privacy, working on security is a way for me to help everyone in the world. And the work I do, I don't really do work for clients. I don't receive money and sell my work. Instead, I work in what's called open source, which means that all the work I do is work that I give away to everyone in the world. So anyone can use it. Okay. So social movements here in Ecuador say that there has been an attack against independent media under this current government. What do you think are the implications of these apparent attempts to silence or curtail press freedom and the right of the public to have access to information? I, I think access to information is extremely important. If you don't have an informed public, you once again, an informed public is necessary for democracy. You can't make good choices if you don't know what is going on. And censorship is a real problem in this. Uh, my, uh, my guards uh, and the Ecuadorian government tried to make me uh, shut up of, uh, and uh, tried to, try to stop me from talking to the media after my habeas corpus hearing on Thursday. Uh, and in the bail hearing uh, on May 29th, they actually stopped me from going to the courtroom. Of course, they claim that this was because of security reasons, that there was a threat against me, but we have no indication that such a threat exists, and, and we, we fear that this was done to stop me from talking to media. Um, and the final question, um, what, are you, what are your plans going forward? I mean, after everything comes to a conclusion, um, if you are never charged at all, what are your plans? So. <laughs> If, if, when we prove my innocence, I am going to continue working. I'm going to continue spending time with my friends. But most importantly, I am going to stay here in Ecuador. Ecuador is my home, and I love living here. I love the people, and I want to continue being here and being part of society and being part of uh, and continue doing what I have been doing before all this happened. So, if you can speak to anyone, um, or even to the authorities that be that can hear your story about the inhumane conditions mm -hmm. at the prisons, uh, what would you say to these people? I would say, please, please help. I would say that in this situation, these people are suffering. And yes, these people have in some cases committed crimes. There, I mean, we know that there are also innocent people charged with crimes that are in prison. But even if these people have committed crimes, they still are human beings. They deserve our respect. They deserve treatment as any human being and this current situation needs to stop. There needs to be enough money, there needs to be incentives to stop all these problems, to stop the overcrowding, to stop the corruption, to stop all of these bad conditions that make this prison life into a suffering that is not meant to be. Going to prison is punishment enough. You don't have to actually be in a situation where all of your human rights are, are completely taken away just because you do go to prison. So. This needs to change. Ecuador needs to improve on these conditions rapidly. Yeah. Thank you so much for joining us, Olabini. We do appreciate uh, you being here and shedding light on what you've experienced uh, being in prison and going forward with your investigation. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. We'll take a short break now. When we come back, Venezuela commemorates Carabobo Day. Don't go away. Enjoy the best content in spaces where you will discover new perspectives, innovation, well-being, conservation, equity, traditions, a wide variety of contents that you will find at home in the world. The news source of Latin America and the Caribbean. We are present at every event where our nations are staring. We believe in a new global vision, united in every broadcasting. We keep expanding our horizons and working on a closer and better communication. Now, in Grenada. 
Telesur, the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Venezuela is celebrating the Battle of Carabobo Day, a crucial triumph in the struggle for the country's independence. President Nicolas Maduro and the head of the army led an act in commemoration of the patriots who won the battle 198 years ago. In 1821, under the command of Simon Bolivar, the invading Spanish royalist army was defeated and Caracas was liberated. To look back and study the history of the struggle for independence, led by our liberator, Simón Bolívar, its never-ending source of lessons that are very much alive in these historic times we are living. To give us the strength and perseverance, we need to insist a thousand times on the absolute independence of Venezuela in the 21st century, in the anti-imperialist fight of all people united in a civic military alliance. To know that the cause we defend was filled with blood on these fields, of all martyrs and heroes. Nicaragua's Sandinistas commemorated the life and work of Commander Carlos Fonseca, the father of the Sandinista Popular Revolution on the 83rd anniversary of his birth. Activities were led by President Daniel Ortega and Vice President Rosario Murillo. Together with youth and party members, they gathered at the mausoleum of Commander Fonseca at the Revolution Plaza. They paid homage to Fonseca and other anti-imperialist Nicaraguan figures whose legacy continues in the struggle for peace. And we say to Carlos, and we say to Didian Gen, and we say to Jose Dolores Estrada, and we say to Andres Castro, and we say to Zeledon, and we say to Sandino, here are so many sons and daughters, the one father, to defend peace. Firmly, with dignity, without selling ourselves, and without surrendering at any point. Long live Carlos Fonseca. Sandino lives. The struggle continues. In Haiti, anti-corruption protesters took to several major cities to urge the resignation of President Jovenel Moise. Protesters say that corruption and bribery are at the core of Haitian politics, but that the United States and the OAS continues to back the government. In Port-au-Prince, a mock coffin was carried, symbolizing demonstrators' hope for an end to the current regime. The United Nations hearing on Puerto Rico's decolonization is underway with impassioned pleas from petitioners for the U.S. to move forward with a process to allow the Puerto Rican people to take decisions in a manner or in a sovereign manner and to address their urgent economic and social needs. The U.S. government has repeatedly refused to comply with the U.N.'s mandates and with international law requiring the decolonization of Puerto Rico. Puerto Rico's pro-independence leader lambasted the U.S. when he took the floor at the U.N. I believe it is time for the United, Gen United Nations General Assembly to rectify the mistake it made in 1953 by taking Puerto Rico off the list of non-self-government non countries and accepting the mendacity that the United States government presented to it, which alleged that Puerto Ricans, by voting in favor of the Constitution of, of, of the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico in 1954, had their self-determination right exercised. No such thing ever happened. What we see in Puerto Rico is an accelerated gentrification project, more privatization, Gentrification is synonymous with the displacement of communities and construction 
of very expensive property. The number, the number of buying foreign buyers and occupiers is growing exponentially. Again, the decolonization and independence of Puerto Rico is what we need, and we need it fast. Thank you. During the hearing, petitioners also demanded that the Puerto Rican people have a voice in federal policies that affect them. The U.S. government, through laws, has made it harder for Puerto Rico to take control of its finances and economy. The vice president of Puerto Rico's Independence Party says, as a result, the U.S. territory is saddled with $73 billion worth of public debt. We need to revise the relationship with the United States. Some people are calling it by the right name now. We are a colony. It is increasingly evident that we cannot ensure political stability under the current scheme. There is a public debt due to restructuring taking place and negotiated uh, on behalf of Puerto Rico by the uh, board. It is twice what we can pay. There is uh, the threat of greater further bankruptcy. Guyana's government has proposed that it remains in office until a president is sworn in after fresh elections are held. The Attorney General made the proposal ahead of Monday's court hearing to determine the consequential orders following the upholding of the no-confidence motion that toppled the government. The opposition has demanded the immediate resignation of the government, the holding of elections in three months, and the use of a claims and objections exercise to finalize the voters' list. The government is proposing that the National Assembly convene to pass a resolution to extend the time for the holding of an election. And in Guyana, activists have held the country's first ever pride parade. Guyana is the only country in South America to criminalize homosexuality under colonial era laws. Hundreds of participants marched through the streets of the capital to call for an end to discrimination. Marches called for legal reform to relax restrictions on transgender people and permit same-sex couples to gain legal recognition. The LGBT community in the Caribbean diaspora put the region's diverse heritage on full display during recent Pride celebrations in Queens, New York. Hundreds took to the streets to the sounds of Chutney Soka music, proudly affirming their Caribbean LGBT identities as well as their Afro and Indo-Caribbean ancestry. This year's celebration commemorated the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall Uprising. On June 28, 1969, police raided the Stonewall Inn, a gay club in New York City. The raid sparked six days of protests and violent clashes with law enforcement. This became a catalyst for equal rights movements in the U.S. and around the world. More stories coming up, starting with an attempted coup in Ethiopia, which left high-level officials dead. Stay with us. We have been present in all the events stirring our people. United for each transmission and in tune we bet on a new Latin American vision. Now we are also accompanied by the Caribbean people of St. Kitts and Nevis. Each day working for the best understanding and communication. Tell us who the new source from South America and the Caribbean. Welcome back. Ethiopia's army chief and the governor of Amara region have been killed during a failed coup attempt. 
General Siari McConan and another officer were shot dead by their own bodyguard as they were trying to prevent the coup attempt. The government says the attack was linked to the assassination of the governor of Amara a few hours earlier in the city of Bahir Da. General McConan was killed at a meeting in his office along with his senior advisor. The region's attorney general was also present but was left seriously wounded. The Chief of Staff of the Ethiopian National Defense Forces, Gen General Sa'ara Makonnen, together with retired Major General Gazai Abarra, were also attacked within the home of General um, Sa'ara Makonnen. Uh, this was happening within his residence. And this heinous crime was committed by the bodyguard of um, General Sa'ara General Sa Makonnen himself. Both of them sustained um, heavy wounds and as a result have passed on. And the suspected ringleader of Saturday's failed coup attempt in Amara region is on the run. Six people, including the bodyguard who killed the army chief, are now known to have died in the unrest. The government has since declared a day of mourning to mark the deaths, while heavy security forces have been deployed in Amara's capital, Bahir Da. A protest was held in front of the White House in Washington, D.C. on Sunday with demonstrators demanding no war on Iran. The gathering was attended by several organizations as well as by Iranian U.S. citizens who warned that the Trump administration is actively considering carrying out a military operation of an unknown magnitude against Iran. The group's answer coalition, Code Pink, and Popular Resistance say they are committed to mobilizing people in the U.S. to say no to all forms of aggression against Iran. This includes sanctions aimed at making life unbearable for all Iranians. In Turkey, with nearly 100% of votes counted for Istanbul's mayoral elections, the ruling party's candidate has conceded defeat. Preliminary results show that candidate for the opposition CHP party, Ekrem Imagulu, obtained 54% of the votes. Imamoglu narrowly won the initial election in March, but those results were officially annulled due to the narrow nature of his victory and a number of reported irregularities. The candidate for the ruling AK party, Benali Yildirim, has congratulated his rival on the victory. We've come to the end of this news brief. You can find these and many other stories on our website at telesurenglish.net. For our viewers in Africa, remember you can find us on Stasa Channel 461 in South Africa and Channel 539 in Nigeria. And join us on social media for Telesur English. I'm Doris Polo. Thank you for watching.